Hello, this is my oral presentation number three. I will be discussing the Oligocene Epoch. The Oligocene Epoch happened between 33.9 and 23 million years ago. This uh, time period was right about in the middle of the Cenozoic era. It was between when the dinosaurs became extinct and present day. So this time period was, was important because it, was, it marked the shift between the um, tropic climate and environment of, um, of old earth and the modern arid kind of grassland uh, ecosystems that we see today. Uh, the key component of this epoch was the tectonic plate movement. For one, you, you, during this time you saw the Indian Plate and Asian Plate collided, which created the Himalayan Mountains, which of course has Mount Everest, the tallest mountain in the world. And in that particular region that had its own effects, it, it created a, a shadow over the um, either side of the mountains, which um, eradicated those kind of coastal climates and ecosystems and kind of made it more of a grassland forest area. And so what you saw was uh, the North American plate and the Eurasian tectonic plate. They were moving further away, which, which allowed the Atlantic Ocean to widen more and more. But the most important tectonic plate movement during this time was South America and Australia. Those, the uh, plates that those two continents lie on, they broke away from Antarctica. This, this created a... a a shift in the ocean currents which had its effect on the climate, which had its effect on the marine life, which indirectly had an effect on the land life as well. In this picture you can see in the map up top this was 35 million years, this is just a uh, you know a approximation, a, a guess from the computer models that they have of what the uh, continents and the oceans looked like at this time. This was 35 million years ago right about at the start of the Oligocene epoch. And you can see that South America and Australia are just split away from Antarctica. And you can see that there is a, a new passage for these oceans to move through. And the picture on the bottom is, of course, the Himalayan mountains, which were formed during this time. And that's Mount Everest. The climate of the Oligocene epoch experienced some notable changes. Um, for one, the average global temperatures lowered. Also, the, it became much more arid and dry. Um, the reason that these things happened was because of, as I described previously, the South American and Australian plates separating from Australia. Or not Australia, from Antarctica. The reason that, that that has had an effect on the climate is because what that did is it created that ocean passage along the southern part of the Earth. And that passage has allowed the oceans to form new circulation patterns and they have been able to circulate around the earth in a much more efficient way because they have um, more space to move and what that's done is the oceans take up most of earth and in these oceans they contain most of the earth's heat because they are most of the earth and so as they are able to move around and disperse much more freely, it also disperses the, the Earth's heat around the globe um, much more evenly. Uh, another important thing that happened was as those two continental plates broke away from Antarctica, it also, along with lowering the temperatures, it also gave Antarctica room to grow. And so ice caps started to spread out from Antarctica. And what this means is that the ocean water was starting to freeze up down at the, at the, North, or at the South Pole. Uh, this, of course, lowered the sea levels. Uh, you can see how this had an effect because um, the uh, Isthmus of Panama formed. And I will discuss later in the life section of this presentation how that had its own effects in and of itself. But the most uh, notable thing about the climate during this time was that it shifted to a more um, cooler, arid, more grassland, foresty kind of 
climates, ecosystems, instead of the uh, tropical ones that that covered the Earth before. Here in this this graph, you can see how the temperature was following this general trend of decline, and that didn't change during the Oligocene epoch. You can see the Oligocene right between the Eocene and the Miocene epoch on the uh, left center side. The Oligocene epoch was marked by the expansion of mammals. Uh, mammals dominated during this time period because of the climate change that I had that I've described earlier in this presentation. As the temperatures became cooler, what that did was it confined um, cold-blooded animals like reptiles or amphibians or a lot of the marine life. It confined them to living in areas around the equator where it was warm enough for them to survive. Whereas mammals who are warm-blooded, meaning that they can self-regulate their own body heat, were able to remain in these colder areas further away from the equator. This uh, this this kind of this kind of gave mammals the key to the entire world, whereas whereas the other species were forced to live in, in certain areas where they could survive. So this this really allowed the mammals to um, evolve freely in in a large number of ways. And you can you can even see this uh, was true in the oceans as whales were the dominant animal in the oceans. And another reason why these mammals thrived was because of the expansion of grasslands. Uh, animals that feed on grasslands, as I'm sure you know, are mammals. There you know there aren't any reptiles that I know of that eat grass. And so this kind of this change in climate really, really helped the mammals to become the top, sp top species on Earth. Um, here, you, the top left picture is a parasodactyl. It's, it's, it was the largest land mammal, and it was uh, scientists likened it to a, uh, a hornless rhino. Now, the reason I put that picture on there is because during uh, this epoch, the uh, there, there was a growth of really large mammals like elephants. This was the first time. This time period was the first time that elephants actually evolved. Uh, top right is a picture, of course, of just a monkey. It's you know just a drawing, and that's just to show that the monkeys first evolved in Africa. Now, this is not to say that there were no uh, primates at, before this time, because there were. But this is just uh, this was just the next step towards uh, the human evolution happened during this time. Uh, the picture on the bottom, this was just a, a fun picture because the uh, megalodon, of course the biggest shark in earth history, uh, evolved during this time. Um, another thing which I forgot to mention was, as I described earlier, the Isthmus of Panama it formed because of the lowering sea levels, and the reason that, that had an effect was because it separated the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. And, as I'm sure you know, isolation creates a, you know, differing forms of evolution. And so in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, these whales and all fish, all animals in the ocean evolved on a certain tract, you know, depending on what their environment was in the Atlantic. Whereas in the Pacific Ocean, they evolved in a, a different tract, not associated with the Atlantic Ocean. And so you can see how diversity grew during this time because of small things like that. Now I would like to explain how we know these things. The, um, the way that we know about where the continents were and where the different uh, tectonic plates were in the past is what, what they've done is they've observed these plates and you know recent times and we can see both the direction that the plates are moving and we can see how fast they are moving through just simple observation taking data points and matching it um, and with that information they've constructed these uh, computer models where they can backtrack through time following if you know assuming that these tectonic plates follow have followed the same general pattern in the past, 
which there's no reason to believe that they hadn't, unless there is reason to believe, in which they would adjust their uh, approximation. Um, and so they've created these, these computer models which pretty much move backwards in time and show where the plates were in the past. Um, the way that we know about what life was around during this time is fossil records. That's that's all. That's it for that. And the way that we know um, when a fossil was from a certain time is carbon dating is a important. It's a widely used thing in that field, and uh, and that's it. It works pretty well, at least for the Oligocene epoch, and you know epochs that have happened fairly recently because carbon dating is pretty accurate with uh, time scales that short. And the way that, that uh, scientists know about the past temperatures and thus climates is it's a, a little bit more uh, complex. So there are, there are these animals in the ocean. They kind of dwell on the surface they're called foraminifera, and what they'll do is they'll make they they have they, they all have these little small shells made up of calcium carbonate, and when these little animals die, their shells fall down through the ocean, and as they're sinking down, they collect sediment, and what that sediment does is it kind of it encapsulates that uh, shell so that it uh, remains. Um, remains as it was in the past today. And so what they'll do is they will they will take these 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 sediment encapsulated shells and look at the shells and look at the ratio between the oxygen 18 and oxygen 16 isotopes. And depending on what that ratio is, that actually tells scientists the temperature at a certain time. And they can tell of course when uh, that shell is from because it has carbon in it and carbon dating. Um, there is a, uh, a there is there is a variability with this. It's not a hundred percent accurate, but there's I don't know if there's a way to be a hundred percent accurate about anything in the past. But these are the methods that they use to um, find these things out. 